Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this extremely important conference, and I will talk about the reasons why this conference is important, especially for us Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. And, but before that, I just want to say that I'm honored to be sitting next to Felicia Langer. Felicia Langer has no clue who Haider Eid is, by the way. But in the mid-80s, she defended my cousin. In, and she drove her car to Gaza, and I saw her, and I was about 18, 17 years old. I shook hands with her, and I thanked her very much for everything that she did. I, I had already read her uh, wonderful book with my own eyes, and I am really honored. I never expected to be sitting next to uh, Valencia Lange. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that. And I also, and I, yeah, on my behalf. <laughs> Um, and, I also, and I also want to, be, to, to say that I'm also honored to be sharing a platform with uh, my friend and colleague and comrade Mazen Komsiya. I've been working with Mazen Komsiya for years since he was in the United States of America, and this is the first time I meet him in person. The same thing applies to Ali Abu Na'ma, the editor of Electronic Intifada and the author of one of my favorite books, One Country, uh, about proposal to end the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and, of course, Elan Pape, my brother and comrade. We've shared a lot of platforms, but every single time we shared the platform, I was doing it from Gaza via video conference or on the phone. And this is the first time I meet, uh, of course, in person with Elan Pape. And thank you. And the same thing, of course, um, yeah, applies to Lubna Masarwa. Lubna Masarwa came on the second uh, you know, uh, free Gaza boat, uh, breaking, of course, uh, in a very, very brave move, breaking the siege. We met for only one hour, but since then we have been on the phone all the time talking about you know, the best solution to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and we've developed a personal relationship. She became a comrade in arms. But the reason, actually, or rather the cause why um, I have, you know, have been able to meet with these people is Atiyah Rajab and Verena and the Palestine Solidarity Group in Stuttgart. I don't remember all the names, but I would like to thank all of you. And, and there are two things, two, two key points that I want to discuss in my paper. And the first one is, of course, I was asked by Atiyah and Verena to talk about, you know, the South Africa, you know, Israel analogy. I will be doing that. But um, as, um, as our kind moderator has just said, this is the first time that I managed to leave Gaza since the imposition of the deadly hermetic siege uh, January, since January 2006. I've tried only once to leave Gaza. That was, I think, June 2007. I spent the whole day at the Rafah crossing uh, with, about, with more than 40,000 Palestinians, terminally ill people. I saw cancer patients. I saw old people. I saw people dying. And I spent the whole day trying to cross the Rafah crossing and at the end of the day I fainted and that was the only time that I experienced you know that I faint in my life and then I decided never to try again until uh, do I need to slow down yes. I need to slow down all right sorry <laughs> yeah all right so uh, yeah and then of course I had uh, um, I had this invitation from the Palestine solidarity group in Stuttgart and then it was followed up by a phone call uh, from Atiyah Rajab, and he managed to convince me to try again. And I've tried, and here I am with you in Stuttgart, in Germany, for the first time in my life. And I am thankful and grateful to everybody in, in, in Germany. Thank you so much. That was um, a bit of a long introduction. <laughs> I know that. But as I said, I want to talk first um, about Gaza. I know that I'm supposed to be talking about, um, you know, Palestine, Israel, and the best solutions. And uh, I have a different opinion from one of my role models, Felicia Langer, that, you know, the, 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 two state, the one state solution is unrealistic. I think it is the only alternative that we are left up with. I, I strongly believe, um, and unlike the Palestinian leadership, 
whether in Gaza or in the West Bank or even the left, that the only fair and just solution that we are left up with is a secular democratic state on the historic land of Palestine, a state for all of its citizens, regardless of religion, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of gender, exactly like the solution South Africans had. That is the only solution that can bring about peace with justice in the Middle East. That is something that we believe in. I can say, yes, we do not have a lot of supporters, but we are laying the ground for that. And I'm going to discuss that at a later stage. But first, I would like to start by telling you about our experience in Gaza uh, before the genocidal war. And I'm using the word genocide here very consciously. And, and after, of course, we are still going through what uh, my friend here, Elan Pape, actually, in one of his first articles, uh, after the imposition of the siege, he called it a slow motion genocide. And it is a slow motion genocide. And believe me, slow motion genocide is much, much more painful than a quick genocide. Yeah, well, I mean, I remember on the 1000th anniversary, or rather day of the imposition of the siege, we lost um, uh, patient number uh, 1,000. That is, to, uh, sorry, 500. Which means we lost one, the life of one patient every two days. And that is a slow motion genocide. And I want to start by talking about the genocidal war that took place for 22 days in which we lost more than, more according, by the way, according to mainstream Israeli and international human rights organizations, we lost the lives of more than 1,434 people, 90% of whom were civilians, and 4,034 of whom were children. I mean, children, and this is the worst part of it. This is really the worst part, and every single time I think about it, it drives me nuts, actually. It drives me crazy that, you know, children are deliberately targeted. Um, when, on the first day of my arrival here in Stuttgart, I, was, um, I had a meeting with the Palestine Solidarity Group, and I started by talking about what happened back in um, February, March 2000, uh, 2008. And that time, I remember very well, the Israeli occupation forces invaded the northern part of the Gaza Strip, stayed there for about five to six days, killed more than 164 people, including 64 children. Now, some of my comrades from the Solidarity Group told me that actually it didn't make news. It didn't make news. I mean, that was, everybody remembers that, February, everybody from Palestine, Israel, remembers that very well. And that time, if you remember Matan Vilnai, the Deputy Defense Minister, threatened us, the Palestinians of Gaza, with a greater Shoah. And I mean, this is not my word, this is what Matan Vilnai, the Deputy Defense Minister, used then. A greater Shoah. Shoah is a word... You know the word, I mean, it means a holocaust. I mean, coming from the deputy foreign minister, rather the deputy defense minister, we thought that would create an outrage, that the world would do something. And in fact, that was, that, that, that was a rehearsal. That was a rehearsal. Because Israel wanted to test international reaction to massacres, to the killing of children. And I remember, we worked on a documentary, and you can see it online, called Forbidden Dreams. Our comrades here saw it. And it was about some of the children that were targeted in March 2008. Four of, four of them were from the same family, the Dardona family. They were killed midday, around 12 o'clock. Apache helicopter targeted them. And I remember very well, I mean, there was an interview with the, with, the, with the pilot. And he saw that these children were playing soccer at 12 o'clock. And then he shot. He killed them. I remember very well the story of Safa Hamouda. Safa Hamouda, I remember hearing her father on one of the local radio stations in the morning, calling around between 8 and 9 o'clock. I heard him with my own ear, begging 
for help because his child had been shot in the abdomen. One, one bullet, but she was bleeding. Then, of course, he was asking for an ambulance. UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Work Agency, was not allowed to send its ambulance. The Red Crescent was not allowed to send an ambulance. The Red Cross was not allowed to send an ambulance. At 11 o'clock, Abu Safa, Safa's father, called again. He said, well, she's bleeding and she's going to die. And we are not allowed to take her to hospital. Two o'clock, he called again. Five o'clock, he called again to say that she's dead. That she's dead. And she died. 11 years old, Safa Hamouda died. Now, that is only one story. And I'm not saying this because we need sympathy. Actually, the message that I'm bringing from Gaza is that, no, we don't need sympathy. The message I am saying, or rather the message that I'm bringing from Gaza, is that we are fed up. We are fed up. Really, we are fed up. And in Arabic is hegna. And I'm saying it in Arabic and I'm saying it in English because, I mean, I wrote an open letter to Barack Obama, which he never read, of course. And I said to him, in the name of the Palestinian people, in the name of the Gazans, I mean, and, and by the way, when people were singing songs after Barack Obama won the elections, actually, I was very realistic. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to claim, you know, wisdom retrospectively. I'm saying that I never had hopes. I never had high hopes. I mean, there was never a serious radical change in the establishment of the United States of America, an imperialist establishment. And therefore, America is giving more and more support to Israel. So my point, my point is, Israel killed more than 164 people in March 2008. The international community did absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And therefore, Israelis realized and understood that they could come back again on the 27th of December, and I remember that very well, 11.25 a.m. And I had just driven by the main police station 15 minutes before the first attack, more than, and that attack led to the deaths of more than 270 people. And notice the timing. I mean, 11.25, children are going to school and because we have two shifts. Gaza is too crowded, people who know Gaza. And children were coming back from school. And therefore, most of those who got killed were children. Now, two days before that, Sipi Livni, a war criminal by all standards, warned us from Cairo. And she said, and I'm quoting, Hamas must stop the launch of Qassam rockets from Gaza. And then two days later, we paid a heavy price. We paid a very, very heavy price. The massacre continued for 22 days. We expected the international community to do something. And here when I say the international community, I want to make a difference between you are the international community, we love you. We love you. Solidarity groups, grassroots organizations, civil society organizations. You were the people who helped bring about the end of apartheid. And we bank on you. We count on your efforts. But we have a problem with the United Nations. We have a problem with Security Council, with the Quartet and European Union, Arab League, Organization of Islamic Conferences. Tons of condemnations, statements of condemnations actually never convinced Israel to stop its massacre of the Palestinian people. I remember very well that on the, I think it was the fifth day, of course we couldn't sleep for 22 days. And again,